I was going to say that regarding the whole um, younger boys narrative, um, just like you mentioned previously, uh, the train station debacle kind of forced Dan Reed to pretty much throw Safe Chuck under the bus and say, oh, well, he wasn't, it didn't stop when he was 14. It went on until he, he was an adult. He, he, he actually went on a podcast and said, oh, yeah, it, it, it was just, um, it just continued. It was just the, the same people that he was having sex with while they were young. He carried on till they were adults. What's also interesting about that is that, um, you know, they claim that he likes to replace younger, the boys with young, even younger boys. It turns out that at least in Robson's case, um, Macaulay Culkin and Brett Barnes are both older than Robson. But here's the interesting thing, um, based on what you were saying earlier. This is what we have to believe, if Dan Reed is correct. In the 2005 trial, Michael Jackson basically put all his victims on the stand. Do you, do you understand what I'm getting at? A hundred percent. And um, l l let me just uh, first address the, the train station thing. And then what your second point is also uh, very, very important. I was shocked when Dan Reed uh, did what he did with, re mm -hmm. the, with regard to the train station revelation. And for those who are unaware, uh, effectively, James Safechuck had listed the train station as one of the places where Michael Jackson had abused him, except there was a problem, a big problem, and that is that the train station did not exist at, during the time. The time, at the time period. And it wasn't close. And during the time period in which Safechuck um, supposedly had been abused. Now, I thought that the natural reaction to that would be they, they really couldn't claim that the, the train station existed because that was very well documented in numerous ways. So I figured what Reed would simply say was, well, it's PTSD. And he didn't, he didn't, he didn't remember. Yeah. He didn't remember, you know, because, because one of the beauties of these fake victim allegations is that being a victim itself is an excuse for why you can't remember anything yeah. properly yeah. because because that's what ptsd supposedly does which yeah. by the way i don't I, I i've never understood the ptsd ptsd has replaced repressed memory which got discredited okay. got discredited in court and so now the therapists all say ptsd but nobody ever suggests that if if you have an event that causes ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder that you you forget what happened or the details of what happened. It's not like you ever forget, oh, I was in a rock and I got, you know, hit with a bombshell. I mean, I, and that's that's why I have P PTSD. I mean, that that's that no one does that. That's not no. part of the part of the of what PTSD is. You do remember it, but it may have caused you some level of uh, permanent stress afterwards, which I, I'm OK, fine. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't that doesn't get you off the hook for for not remembering massive details and so i honestly thought to me that was when i first realized oh dan reed is not just wrong about this he's dumb i mean it was from a strategic <laughs> standpoint hmm. and i i because that's always been the playbook that's the that is that's you know yeah. on the first page of the playbook if any details don't match just say oh we misremembered because of the you know the yeah, ptsd oh, oh. Oprah tried it. Yes. Oprah said something similar. Right. So so the details never are supposed to matter. Of course, details have to matter because mm -hmm. in, yes, an allegation, absolutely. in an allegation that it, where it's one person's word against another person, especially when that person is dead, then the details have to matter, have to especially, matter. Yes. especially when it's an old allegation. And so um, anyway, so that I, I was I thought to be very important. Because it really exposed that Dan Reed is not a smart person, and and uh, and I, I, I that's not that's now my current belief system regarding Dan Reed that he is mm -hmm. he's flat out dumb, he's corrupt and dumb, and um and and so I that's my 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 assessment of Dan Reed. As far as 
the the second issue, which I'm now forgetting, which, which was the second issue you brought up with regard to... I, I said, essentially, what they're trying to say is if we are led to believe that what Dan, what Dan Reed and the rest of them are claiming is true, which is that both Macaulay Culkin and Brett Barnes are were abused by Jackson, they're essentially now claiming that in 2005, in the trial of his oh, life, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jackson right, yeah. essentially said, yeah, you can have the guys that I really did abuse, you know, knock yourself out. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry that, uh, that that's okay. My, my, my train of thought got lost there, but yeah, because this is another big issue to me, especially given my relationship with Tom Mazzarell. Because Tom Mazzarell, here's what you you also have to believe: you have to believe that Tom Mazzarell, mm -hmm. one, one of the smartest and best criminal defense attorneys in the in the world, had, decides to put on the stand as the star, the first, basically the, the centerpiece, mm -hmm. the centerpiece of Michael Jackson's defense. His his life is on the line. Mesro has said publicly that a <laughs> conviction for Michael Jackson is a death sentence. It's a death he, sentence, absolutely. Because, because he can't go to he can't go to prison given who he is. And so he decides to put on the stand <laughs> one of a, what, what, what if, if Dan Reed is right, one of Michael Jackson's worst victims, in other words, the people he, one of the people he abused worst of yeah. anybody, most blatantly, um, and, 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 and Wade Robson, because Wade Robson was the star, one of the star first you know, witnesses. One of, them, yeah. Yeah, one of the, the first, wit I think he might have been the first witness. He was the first the, one, yes. Okay, so, so he's the first witness, the first witness for the defense yeah. <laughs> is somebody who had been brutally abused by Michael Jackson. Tom Mesro is nowhere near dumb enough for that to even Homer, be a... Homer Simpson wouldn't do that. <laughs> right. It, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And and let's, and, and, you know, there's so many problems with Wade Robson uh, and his story. But I, frankly, and I said this almost immediately on the Glenn Beck radio show, which is a major national yeah, radio, I, sh radio I, show. I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. Okay. Here in America... And um, I think I shocked him because he was kind of buying into the allegations mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, but yes. I, I, I said, if we're going to believe Wade Robson, we might as well throw out our entire legal system because mm -hmm. because th there's nobody who is more on the record in both a legal and not legal standpoint as an adult, as an adult mm -hmm. for, for not having been abused by Michael Jackson. Than Wade Robson, he testified at his criminal trial. Yeah. He was asked. He was asked very specific, specific questions. Question. Yes, he was. Under, yes, under oath, under oath, and uh, defended Jackson to the hilt. And I also, and this gets a little bit more controversial and risky, but can we please look at Wade Robson's personal narratives? And I'm not just talking about the fact that he had a massive incentive. To make an allegation when the when the Jackson estate didn't give him the choreography job mm -hmm. in, in Las Vegas that he was expecting and even bragging about, that's clearly yes. what yeah. motivated him in, in later on into becoming a uh, a quote unquote victim. But mm -hmm. can we please can we please look at what he, his story is based upon what we know of his life? So his story is that he gets abused by Michael Jackson for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. right, right before he hits puberty, right? And so so he's being brutally, horribly sexually abused. Now, Dave Chappelle, the comedian, does a great job of <laughs> yeah, um, of, uh, of of making making a, a joke and I think illustrating how absurd Wade Robson's allegations is and he are and he says, I don't believe him. Um but but if you believe well, Ray Robson's story. So he's going, he's in the prepubescent era of his life, and he's simultaneously being abused by Michael Jackson brutally, while also engaging in a very sweet puppy love turned into real romance relationship mm -hmm. with Michael Jackson's niece, Brandy, mm -hmm. who, yes. Michael Jack who Michael Jackson set him up with, <laughs> right? Yes. And 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 by the way, they're dating for a very long time before they have mm -hmm. an, an intimate relationship. So that by the way, right there, I mean there's so many problems, but right there, 
Mm-hmm. How does that make any sense? Because if it Wayne doesn't. Rob, if Wayne Robson is having full on sex for as much as you could conceive of, of a prepubescent boy engaging in full on sex with Michael Jackson, and yet he's having this very sweet relationship with Brandy Jackson, where there there is apparently no intimacy for quite a while. For until, quite a while, yes. Uh, until they're in the into the mid late teen stages. Um, and and they engage in this Brandy and Wade engage in this very long, seems like like I said at the time for the at the least at the time very sweet relationship, yeah, that, like a courtship, that, right? That that far far exceeds the mm-hmm. dates of the Michael Jackson relationship. So he continues on with this relationship with Brandy, but then here's the kicker: then <laughs> a- after he ends the relationship with Brandy. Um, and Brandy is completely convinced, as, as when I interviewed her, and this was a big yeah, moment for me personally, completely convinced that he's not just lying in the movie, he's laughing during the movie because she can tell when he's holding back uh, laughter at some of the allegations that he's making. That he, she knows he's totally lying. But for me, and again, this this takes a leap. I, I mean, it's not a leap of logic, but it requires people to actually follow basic logic and the way human beings work. So not long after the relationship with Brandy and Wade Robson ends, Wade Robson, who is by this point a very well-known dancer, I mean, he's he's a semi-celebrity of his own, he starts working for Britney Spears. Mm -hmm. And Britney Spears is dating Justin Timberlake at the time. Mm -hmm. And Britney Spears cheats on Justin Timberlake <laughs> with <laughs> Wade Robson. Now, I'm sorry, but everything we have ever been told about victims of child sex abuse, especially the abuse as described by Robson, mm-hmm. would make would make the relationship with Brandy semi impossible, but the relationship with Spears completely impossible. Because, mm. because the level of confidence, confidence, and, yes, and, 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 and the, the level of confidence as a man that you would have to have in your sexuality to to have Britney Spears cheat on Justin Timberlake with you is just—it's mind blowing, and it's completely inconsistent with the idea. You know what it is consistent with? It's consistent mm. with a guy who as he was coming of age became very well known because he was friends with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. And, and that would imbue in a young boy an enormous amount of confidence, the type of of confidence that would enable you to potentially have an affair with Britney Spears Spears, at, at the, at the height of her, her fame while she's dating Justin Timberlake, another famous person that Makes sense, but the idea, the idea that, uh, that of the of the timeline that I just gave you, mm-hmm. and the the evolution of Michael Jackson brutally abusing him for years, then overlapping a relationship with Brandy Jackson that goes on for uh, several more years, and then a relationship right after that with Britney Spears, um, to me. That, that well, just well, no, they, there's just no way. They're just making. Uh, uh, sorry, carry on. No, it just doesn't make any sense. And there's uh, uh, and there's and there's no evidence for it. See, I'm I'm course. willing I'm willing to accept things that make no sense at all if there's some level of evidence. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it makes absolutely no sense. And there's no evidence. And there's a massive financial incentive to lie. Of course, of, of so, course. So. All those three things, it's game, set, match. Wade Robson's a liar. Here's, here's, here's the interesting thing. Dan, Dan Reed could, could turn around and say, well, maybe they were not brutally abused. It was quite, because he actually said it was quite pleasant. Oh, well, that's, that's, part, that's part of why he has to go with this absurd narrative that mm. pedophilia, pedophilia is good. Mm. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, that, and that's why, why I, you know, people should look up Dave Chappelle's comedy routine on this because he says it yeah, far better I, than better better yeah, than yeah, I, I ever saw, could. I, I saw or, that. Well and, and I think Dave Chappelle said it best where I mean it's just it it it's absurd and it's almost funny 
when you look at it from the perspective of reality? Well, the interesting thing is that obviously in the film, they claimed that he, he kept them separated from women. So the idea that he, he kept them separated from women and then turns around and says, oh, guess what, Wade? I'm going to introduce you to my niece and you guys are going to date for, I don't know, seven to eight years. You would think at the very least she would have been in the film. I mean, the thing that you, that you were so very, very good in, in, in bringing to everyone's attention who read your article is the lack of balance because there, there, there should be a case of here's what they're saying if it's a documentary anyway, and here's the evidence that might cast, cast some doubt on that. Certainly, Brett Barnes should have been in the film, as should have uh, Macaulay Culkin, because if, you, if you're saying somebody's a victim, then I think you have, you should, at the very least, put their, 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 what, they, what they say on film. If they're saying, no, it didn't happen, you should put them in the film and say, this is what they're saying, this is what these other lot are saying. I mean, to, to be honest with you, uh, John, it's crazy. I saw your interview with Brandy Jackson. Actually, that was really when I first started following you because I thought, okay, here's a journalist. Um, in my world, serious allegations deserve serious scrutiny. In a civilized society, this should be normal, right? It should go without saying that if somebody is making a claim, especially if they've changed their story, and they now want money because they're suing for money. I mean, there's no, I mean, okay, they, they, there's been news that it's a billion dollars. There's actually no monetary amount because I imagine that is something that is discovered that has to be decided later. But they're certainly suing for triple damages saying, oh, loss of earnings and, and trauma and all sorts, of, all sorts of things. So it is interesting. The, 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 the other question I actually wanted to ask you is, well, hold on a second. Before you get to that question, let's just amplify what you just said. Because everything you just said is true, but then also we have to consider the allegations are about a man who is dead, yes. who was who was acquitted unanimously at a trial. Mm -hmm. So so those two things should also push the threshold for the demand for actual evidence to be far greater. So you have old allegations with a massive monetary incentive to lie about someone who is dead and who was already acquitted in a court of law. We already did this. We already did this. They had their shot. And and it for you know it, it didn't work because the jury said it wasn't true. So that ought to mean something. Just because of we course. wait because we wait 14 years, it doesn't it doesn't erase that. Of, of, of so, course. I completely agree with you, John. But here's the problem that I found doing my own research. The media did a very good job of, of hiding why Jackson was acquitted, I think. It's not a coincidence that Charles Thompson actually wrote an article about this in 2010. And the title tells you everything you need to know. One of the most shameful episodes in journalistic history. They did a very good job of essentially poo-pooing what happened in that courtroom. So when you say Jackson was acquitted, most people, even myself included, actually, I originally thought, oh, okay, maybe he just got away with it. It was only when I started to do my own homework and I thought, oh my God, there should have never even been a trial. It was ridiculous. The basis of what they were claiming in that trial was actually in itself was insane. So like what you're, what you're saying is the fact that he's been acquitted should matter, but it didn't matter because to most people, they just equated it with OJ. It happens on Twitter all the time. The moment you say he was acquitted, they say, oh, so was OJ. Mm -hmm. And so most people have no idea how strong his defense was, how ridiculous the allegations against him in 2005 were. And like you said, the fact that they're changing their story, it's an old story. The fact that they want money should be a red flag in a rational society. Sadly, I don't think we live in a rational society because if we did, you wouldn't have to do what you do. You think about it, John, out of all the journalists in the world, we can probably count on one hand the amount of people who actually subjected Leaving Neverland to objective scrutiny. Isn't that shameful? 
Really? Yeah, but unfortunately, it's a hundred percent shameful. But unfortunately, it's not that surprising because of the nature of the subject matter. See, that's that's the problem here. We're we're coming off of the Me Too movement, which means that every allegation is inherently supposed to be considered true now, and and we're also and we're dealing with the worst of sexual abuse allegations because we're dealing with children, and we're mm-hmm. dealing with a ce- massive celebrity who's dead and cannot defend himself. And by the way, can't do anything for any of the members of the media uh, that are covering this. You know, when Michael Jackson was alive, the media at least still had to be somewhat uh, fair to him because okay. he well. had he, somewhat, some, I mean, yeah, because, yeah, because, yeah. because there was the elements of the media that he could still help by giving interviews and access and, okay. and he, he still had power and influence and, and he and the media could there was still something for the media to use from Michael Jackson. Now I'm not look the media coverage of the trial was terrible, and I was even part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and but I mean, but now that he's dead, there it's Katie bar the door. There's there's nothing that Michael Jackson can do for anybody in the news media. So there's no fear. There's no he can't do an interview and call people liars. Or I mean, can you imagine if he was alive? I mean, Michael mm-hmm. Jackson would have been able to do any interview he wanted and and call out Robson and St. Chuck as liars. Yeah, and the allegation would, wouldn't have happened if he was alive, I don't think. Probably not because there would have, I think it would have been, I don't think that HBO would have felt comfortable airing it. Um, and I don't think Oprah would have participated. I mean, Oprah's, mm-hmm. we, we cannot underestimate Oprah's, the, the power of Oprah's participation. She's nowhere near as influential, uh, with, certainly with the public, as she mm-hmm. used to be. But among no. the media, among the media, she is still considered to be uh, some sort of a saint. And let's face it, the, the media is incredibly lazy. Most of them are incredibly stupid. They want a simple story. And for them, Oprah sanctifying a story is true. Mm-hmm. All they have to do is go, well, well, why would Oprah do this? Oprah was a Michael Jackson fan. My, Oprah did the 19, was it 1992 or three, whatever yeah, it was. 92, uh, 93, I think, yes. Yeah, I mean, this massive television event, the highest rated interview of its kind in the history of television with Michael Jackson, a- a- ironically, at the Neverland Ranch. And, um, you know, and this was a huge portion of her career. It was a huge moment in television history. It was the height of Michael Jackson's fame, basically, and and so um, you know, for her to to sanctify these allocations um, with this post movie special had incredible power within the media. Mm-hmm. Yes, because to the to the media that meant oh well, there's no real need, no real need to give any of this any of this any scrutiny. And oh by the way, we're far more likely to give it scrutiny because then we're taking on Oprah. And you know, mm. you know, there's there's no incentive for us to do that, so we're not going to take on Oprah, and um, and so we're just going to have these allegations hang out there unrefuted, and and so the Oprah thing, which I am, I'm still not a hundred percent sure why she did this, but I am convinced that she did this far far more for economic and political reasons than she did for substantive reasons and no, I, I think she did it for ratings that's the only thing i can think of well no, no there's really no i mean she she did this on hbo and hbo really you know as a subscriber uh you know outlet it's really not ratings based and, and oh okay okay i didn't i, I, didn't really, know I really i really don't know that she was going to get evaluated on the ratings of it i think it was okay more i think it was more of a corporate quid pro quo uh where you know there were there were elements that wanted mm. this story told and mm-hmm. they knew that they, and, and i've always said i think this is one of the more underrated things i've always i've ever said about leaving neverland which is if you have a real solid case you don't need it sanctified mm. by oprah no you don't you, you don't need that if you have the only reason why you bring in oprah to sanctify, to to give her blessing, is if your case is so crappy that you have to do a smoke and mirrors mm-hmm. on the media and get them to believe this is all real by you know pro- providing Oprah Winfrey uh, as as a way of making sure that you don't get any negative blowback or any scrutiny for your story. And so 
the Oprah element of this is very, very important. She was chosen. Mm. She was chosen for very specific reasons. Obviously, is a, she is a black woman who is a victim of abuse herself, who had a connection to Michael Jackson back in the heyday. Uh, she provided great value to this story, but it had nothing to do with the truth of the story. And in fact, I think it had more to do with the opposite. She, she, she did. She did distance herself from *Leaving Neverland* once all the inconsistencies started to come out. She, she initially tried to defend it on. I think she was on a show with. Oh, I've forgotten the South African comedian, Trevor. Was it Trevor? Oh, I can't remember his name now. And she kind of just, you know, dismissed it and said, oh, what's the big deal if they, if they get days mixed up? But it's not a day when somebody claims that he was abused regularly in a building that didn't exist at the time. That's a completely different kettle of fish, isn't it? So she distanced herself from it. And I think all mention of Leave Neverland apparently disappeared from her website. But like you said, um, if, if the case was legit, or if it was credible, you wouldn't need somebody to, I suppose, come and green light, if you like. But then again, I suppose maybe they just wanted to blindside everyone. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, th another question I want to ask you is that obviously you are familiar with not just a train station issue with Safe Chuck. You mentioned in your, in your articles about the, when he claimed he told his mum that he was abused right. right um yeah sorry would you just like to uh, elaborate i don't know if you can recall most of the inconsistencies that you well um, i i do remember i do remember i and i'm not sure this is where you're going but shave chuck's mom mom um dances on mm -hmm, uh, yeah. michael jackson's grave uh when he you know she 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 tells this vivid story of when she found out that michael jackson died right yes yes is this that's where, the is one. This where, Okay, yeah, and so yeah. and so the, to me, this is one of the more telling scenes in the movie, where the mom of James Safechuck is talking about how she wakes up to the news of Michael Jackson's death, which, by the way, would have to be an afternoon nap because <laughs> because because this happened in the afternoon on the West Coast. So I, I, immediately, I'm like, wait a minute, you woke up. I think that's almost exactly <laughs> what she said. Yeah, she, you, yeah, you, she did say, yeah. Uh, I, I woke up to the news uh, of Michael Jackson's death, and I was so happy. Oh, well, he's fine. You know, that, that basically, you know, effectively saying my son's abuser is dead. Mm -hmm. Well, the, prob the problem is <laughs> there's no evidence that she would have known about it when he died. Well, of course based not. Of, based upon Safe Chuck's own story. I mean, because yes. Safe Chuck didn't come forward until many years after that. And mm -hmm. there's no indication he told anybody personally. In fact, his story is he didn't even, I don't know, I don't want to misquote him, but my recollection is he either didn't know or didn't remember or didn't think of himself as being abused by Michael Jackson until he saw Wade Robson. Yeah, that's what on, he said, yes. Uh, on the Today Show, which that's was correct. which was like, four years or so mm -hmm. late after Michael Jackson had died, at least three or four years after Michael Jackson Two, had died. 2000, 2012 or 13, I think. Well, it was at least 2013 because I, I remember, um, yeah, it was 2013 because I, I, um, I happened to have been on the Today Show uh, in 2013 um, talking about a similar case, the, the Joe Paterno, Terry Sandusky, Penn State case. And... Matt Lauer had interviewed me and was interviewing Wade mm -hmm. Robson. Oh, and, okay. And Matt Lauer's producer had asked me what I thought of Robson and the interview because, ah. because they had had some suspicions about his story mm -hmm. not being true. And, and, and in the many years since then, I've gotten to know Matt Lauer very, very well. And I can assure you that, and I don't speak for Matt, but – you know, I think that Matt would agree with my personal take on, on Wade Robson, and he was the one that did the interview that James Safechuck supposedly saw and said, oh, oh my gosh, that same thing happened to me. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it until right now. And, um, and, and so he joins in Wade Robson's uh, lawsuit against the Jackson estate. So um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I think that, that the, the mom of James Savechuck saying that in the movie is very, very telling. Mm-hmm. But to me, maybe the biggest smoking gun is the mom of Wayne Robson. I, I think that the most compelling evidence against uh, Leaving Neverland that we found was was very simple. We have Facebook posts mm-hmm. of Wade Robson's mom liking pro Michael Jackson Facebook posts after after Wade mm-hmm. Robson yeah. goes on the Today Show. Now that that right there should be like what? How is <laughs> how is that possible? That right there in a rational world would make most people go whoa whoa Uh-oh. whoa whoa whoa. But then yeah. but then here's the the final nail in the coffin. So I tweet about these Facebook posts that, that where, where Wade Robson's mom was liking pro Michael Jackson's things like his happy birthday, Michael Jackson mm-hmm. and Michael Jackson artwork for a, about a year or so after the uh, Wade Robson Today Show interview that I just referenced. And immediately after I tweet about this, all of a sudden the Facebook likes have been erased they're gone that wade Wade robson's mom has gone in and unliked all of those (laughs) posts now that is consciousness of guilt that Mm -hmm. is conscious that is a cover-up that is knowing that they got caught that is going oops forgot about that um i still liked michael jackson after wade went on the today show because i knew he wasn't telling the truth (laughs) and um and so that to me is is one of the more compelling pieces of evidence that came about that of course has been ignored um by by the media and dan reed has never been asked about it 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 really is incredible i just wanted to run something by you quickly um as to my reason how my research actually began and I, I don't know what you think about this, but I, I had a problem with Robson being a witness in the first place if he had been abused. I just didn't think, I don't even think Homer Simpson would put somebody he abused on the stand to defend him, okay? And that's supposed to be the stupidest character in fiction. But the claim that he, wor- he took his time to work up the courage to tell Jackson he didn't want to testify, and then a week later, he got a subpoena. That was it. That was what done it for me. As soon as I saw that, I was literally screaming at the TV. Like, I swore at the TV because I was like, no, come on, no. Not only would he not be crazy enough to put somebody he abused on the stand, but he, let's even admit that he could have been that crazy. If this victim then says, I don't want to do it, you subpoena him, John? Yeah, um, which of course would be an incredibly massive risk to put that person on the stand. Um, Honestly, uh, and Tom Mesero never would have done it. I asked Tom Mesero in my video interview, which you can find on YouTube, which is really quite good. Yeah, I watched uh, it. it. It's two two parts. It's a, about an hour long or thereabouts, and I think it's you know it's very it's a very good interview on his part. Where um, and I I, I don't want to misstate his answer, but my recollection of his answer was that that was not an accurate representation of what mm-hmm. happened and mm-hmm. that he that he was very confident in putting Wade Robson on the stand yes. and that there was no there was no controversy about putting Wade right. Robson uh, on the stand because Wade knew he had never been abused and <clears throat> was very willing to to tell his story and um and so yeah i mean the, the there's no part of this narrative that makes any sense no, it doesn't. <laughs> but, but what but what you, you do have to you have to believe that Tom Mesero is an absolute imbecile and you <laughs> and you and you have and you and you have to believe that Michael Jackson is be, way beyond crazy. I mean, mm-hmm. he he uh, is a riverboat gambler of epic proportions to <laughs> to to not stop. He, he never says to Tom Mesero, hey, hey, Tom. Maybe we don't put Wade on the stand. I mean, because he knows. Maybe he, we don't put anyone on the stand. <laughs> right. I mean, because I, I know I abused him for several years. I mean, I, 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 and who knows that might come out. Um, 
it's 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 all it's all laughable. It's laughable. It, but, it, it, it is. But you it, have, it is. But you but you have to get into the details, and you have to be open minded, and you have to be able to be capable of rational thought. None of those things exist in most of the media. They they just no, want to. They just they just want the simple story, and the simple story is Michael Jackson was super famous. He seemed to like kids. He was really weird. Wow, seems like a child abuser to me. And. It, it, uh, it, Sorry, carry on. No, and, that, and that's as far as it goes. I mean, and and there's no there's no there's no benefit to a member of the news media, major member of the news media, who has a lot to risk uh, to confront an, an an alleged victim of child sex abuse because those people are protected. They have mm. a halo over their head. They have a force field around them. They're not able. You're not allowed to criticize them, and um, and so. That's where we are today. I mean, you know, these false allegations are only going to continue because it's actually getting fairly easy to make them because because it's, you're it's incredible. You're, you're immune from criticism, and oftentimes you don't even have to give your identity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Sorry, John, carry on. No, it is crazy, and I've seen numerous other cases where false allegations are accepted as as true even when they're obviously not and in fact sometimes the most ludicrous allegations are accepted more easily because the person who's being accused thinks this is so insane i don't even have to defend myself mm. and then by the time they realize they're in big trouble it's too late because the media has accepted the allegation as as true i mean like for instance you know i mentioned matt lauer who's, who's now a friend of mine there are millions of Americans that to this day believe that Matt Lauer had an office where he had a button under his desk where he could lock people into the room so he could rape them. And that, that, that NBC, <laughs> that NBC was aware of this and, and basically, you know, had, had, gave, gave him the, their blessing for that. I mean, it's, wow. it's absurd. I mean, it, it's, it's complete, it's completely absurd. Matt never raped anybody the, the by the way, just for the record, the 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 button which everybody at Matt Lauer's level NBC had simply kept people from coming into his office to interrupt a meeting and did not keep anyone in the office and this is a matter matter of record yet I'm telling you based upon the the, the social media posts I see millions of people believe this to be true because it was a media narrative that was juicy and. I guess made sense to people who don't understand the real world. Wow, it's um. Anyway, um, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I certainly could talk about this all day. I wanted to touch on something very, very quickly that Safe Chuck also said about the. Basically, he claimed that he didn't want to. He refused to testify in two thousand and five. I believe that you mentioned that in your article. Why that actually never happened. Uh, and also the fact that he claimed that when he refused to testify, Jackson threatened him with lawyers. Now, when I read that, my first my first thought was, OK, so this is the scenario. He tells Jackson he doesn't want to testify. Um, and then Jackson then goes to Tom Mesro and says, oh, you know, James said I didn't abuse him before. Well, actually, I did abuse him. But now I want him to lie again and he's refusing. Get him. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> that's essentially what he's claiming. But anyway, I want you to, if you kind of can just elaborate quickly well, on, on. I I think you said it perfectly. I don't know that there's anything else that needs to be said okay. there. Again, again, you you have to believe. First of all, you have to believe a whole confluence of events that that are not consistent with the facts and don't make any sense. But then you also you have to believe that Tom Mesro is an imbecile and Michael Jackson is a sociopath who uh, is. Uh, delusional uh, about 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 defending himself because you you don't put people on the stand or try to put people on the stand that you abused in a trial about whether or not you abused young boys. I mean, it just it doesn't take a whole lot of logic. But I I to me that well, I think that every part of this is significant. To me, I don't even think that much about James Safe Chuck because mm -hmm. Safe Chuck Safe Chuck is literally on Wade Robson's bandwagon, right? Yes. Literally. I mean, literally, yeah. literally, he says, 
I came to my story by watching Wade on the Today Show. All right. Mm -hmm. yes. So, so once you've discredited Wade, which I think is easily done, yeah, easily and, done, and, yes, and and has been done in a hundred different ways, then Save Chuck is pretty much irrelevant. And when he makes the screw up involving the train station, then I'm like, okay, nothing else matters because we already know that the guy you're 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 hitching your wagon to is a liar. Mm -hmm. You're a lot. You're a liar with regard to the train station, and and then the the whole wedding the whole ring. The, the, well, that falls apart. And then just add in, you know, add to it the whole idea that you know they were married and that Michael Jackson gave him a wedding ring, and I, I mean, that's just a ridiculous story to begin with. But also the there there have been sleuths who have done a pretty good job of indicating that the ring involved uh, you know was had all sorts of problems mm -hmm. that this was that this was not uh that he, he basically was just making the whole story up. Yeah, just, just and, making and, and, and 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 if you look at uh his reaction when Oprah goes to ask him about this uh on the HBO after special yeah. he is literally holding yeah. back laughter. He's yeah, literally yeah. he literally is holding back Laugh that is very true with, with everything he possibly can before trying to get very sad and forlorn uh in keeping with the the subject matter it's a it's a joke it's literally a joke as is almost all of the movie leaving neverland i i'm thank you very much um i, I was just going to say knowing what you know now do you would you say the media as a whole is trustworthy I mean, you must admit the journalists like yourself are actually quite rare. And so, I mean, where do we go from here? Because the problem is there's so much that we, we an idiot like me can go online and dig up so much. So why can't the media, at the very least, even if the guy was guilty, give us the information, fair, a balanced you know, narrative of what's actually going on? Well, I do a podcast called The Death of Journalism, which comes out twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, here in the United States, which deals with this issue on a twice weekly basis. Uh, I believe that the news media is fundamentally and catastrophically broken at almost every level. There are dozens, if not a hundred different reasons why this has happened and why it's probably not fixable. A lot of it has to do with economics. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of it has to do with the modern attention span. I mean, there's been a symbiotic relationship between the public's attention span shrinking, then the media's attention sh span shrinking to match that. And then as the media's attention span shrinks, the public's attention span shrinks. And we get, even further. We, we get we get to the point where. I mean, 18 second videos on TikTok of of two girls dancing get you know gets gets millions of views, and you know a, a, an incredibly substantive article debunking a media narrative you know struggles to get a few thousand views. I mean that you know because people just don't have the time or the inclination to get into the details, and it's the media the media that therefore we now go into narrative casting. When you don't have much time, right? And when you when you don't have much time because the attention span is too small, and you don't have much money because of the economics, easy, quick, simple narratives are what carry the day. And the simplest narrative with regard to Michael Jackson is huge celebrity, lots of money, loved children, super weird, must have been a child abuser. That's 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 the narrative now now to be fair i don't know how much of the public really totally or if at all buys that um um i I'd, I'd love to see some interesting you know some credible polling data on that mm, but, within, the, the... But, but within the media that is a, a prevalent belief or at least a belief that they have to pretend uh is mm. the case because that's that's the accepted narrative and to go against it w is dangerous for them it's interesting you say that, but when you, I mean, obviously you're on Twitter because I, I literally, I mean, I, I follow you on Twitter. I've literally followed and read and watched everything you've done since 2019 because I was really, really taken with your 
professionalism, especially in, in, in this matter. Um, on Twitter, there are still a lot of people that buy the narrative. There is still just blatant lies by the media. Just a quick one, I'll give you a quick example. Obviously, you know that the Jackson estate is now in litigation with HBO. Mm -hmm. Now, the Jackson estate were very smart in basically sh showing that they wanted a public arbitration. So they wanted everything to be in, 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 in the public. The media basically said the Jackson estate wants a private arbitration. Dan Reed jumped on the bandwagon and also said the Jackson estate wanted a private arbitration behind closed doors. So I normally don't engage, but I have to go on there and say, hold on a second. Here is the legal document that says the Jackson estate wants a public arbitration. Why is it impossible for you people to just tell the truth? It's just, it's, it's, it's remarkable, honestly. John, I can, I really, really appreciate you doing this. I could talk about this till next week because more than anything, it's, people always say things like, Jackson fans are only defending him because they like their music. Nobody, it, no sane person will defend a pedophile, okay? It's just that there is so much exculpatory evidence out there that just gets completely ignored that when I found out what was going on and when I started following you and I'm thinking, hold on a second, what these guys are saying is, makes sense. What Charles Thompson is saying makes sense. This is a guy who's won awards for exposing pedophile rings for Pete's sake and yet they don't get any traffic. And I'm thinking something is clearly wrong. What is, who is behind or, or what is behind this constant narrative, this false narrative that this is what's going on. Aphrodite Jones couldn't get a publisher to, to publish a pro Jackson book after the trial that she was turned down. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know mm. what you think, whether you think there's more going on behind the scenes than we realize. I don't want to kind of delve into any kind of conspiracy theories. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a conspiracy person at all. However, um, having met with uh, two of the Jackson attorneys at the time, um, one of them, Howard Weitzman, is, is no longer with us. It's no longer, yes. Uh, um, I can I can say, and I've, I've referenced this publicly before, I do think that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. I, I and that's I kind of implied that with with Oprah's uh, involvement in the story. Mm -hmm. I think she she was brought in as part of. I've referred to it previously as a Game of Thrones type of situation. Yeah, I remember you saying that. Yes. That, that that that, and I'm not. I don't make that kind of statement idly or or without basis. Um, uh, there was there was a little bit of a, a mafia thing going on where you know you take one of yours, we'll take one of you know you, one of ours, we'll take one of yours. Um, okay. And and uh, you know and people can probably even figure this out for themselves if they look at some of the headlines involving HBO in this time period. Um, it, it, it was not hidden. Uh, I, I I don't feel comfortable. Uh, articulating all of it, I don't even claim okay. to I don't even claim to fully understand it all. But there was there was a lot going on publicly with regard to who was being taken out and how they were being taken out that that may have played a direct role in HBO's uh, incentive structure here. Although that incentive structure may have changed because they're under new ownership now. Oh, let, me really? say, okay. let me just say one other thing about the hbo lawsuit um it has always been my opinion and i don't have any special knowledge here but to me um the the, the key part of the hbo uh lawsuit which uh, you know I, I think has merit based upon my understanding of the contract that that uh, michael jackson had with hbo mm -hmm. as far as you know not being defamed into perpetuity basically mm -hmm. um um, to me, the most important part of this is the discovery. See, to me, yes. and I've told, I've told, I think I told the Jackson lawyers this, and, and they, they probably already knew this, but I, I strongly believe that 
if the Jackson estate gets full discovery of everything that went into leaving Neverland, mm-hmm. that then Dan Reed is cooked because, because here's what they're going to find. And I know this purely as not even someone who investigated this case, but simply as a documentary filmmaker myself. I mean, I've made three rather prominent documentary films. The, the number one thing as a documentary filmmaker you look at, it's not just the bias and the unfairness. From a technical standpoint, there are so many camera moves while Save Chuck and Robson are telling key parts of their story. And you're, you might be wondering, well, what difference does that make? As a documentary filmmaker, you don't know when the key moment in someone's story is going to happen unless it's scripted. Uh. And so, and so for there to be major camera moves at critical points in the story, to me, mm-hmm. says this was not shot as a documentary. Uh. This was shot as a fictional movie with a script effectively where they did multiple takes because mm-hmm. i mean if you look at a normal documentary you might have multiple cameras if you've got a lot of money but you don't do it's a static shot because okay. if you're if you're doing a real interview with somebody that's based in truth you don't know when the good part's gonna mm-hmm. come you don't no, you know don't. it's gonna come it's gonna come out of nowhere sometimes so you would never go all right hold on we're gonna do this dramatic sweeping you know camera move mm-hmm. right in the because you might screw it up right because <laughs> you because a camera move comes with risk because yes. so so if if what if Robson's telling the key part of his story and we just magically decided to do a camera move right when that happens and we screw up the, uh, yeah. And, and yeah. so the, now we've just lost the key part of the story unless unless mm-hmm. it's unless you're willing to do multiple takes one mm-hmm. you know it's coming and two so so at the very least i'm positive that reed said okay Wade, um, we're going to talk about that time when um, you were forced to engage in this horrendous sex act with Michael Jackson. And, you know, you know here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this camera move and let's do it and let's go take one. Okay. <laughs> and that's I mean, because there's no other way you could do mm. this logistically. <laughs> and so I believe that if they get full discovery, that's all going to be on tape somewhere unless they destroyed it and he so has, sorry I, I need to put this in before i forget he has actually claimed that the camera broke in, in as part of the litigation not only did he try to hide behind the california shield law he also claimed that his camera broke so i would i would guess that those outtakes are, are, are gone well Again, I, I'm just telling you that. And by the way, that to me is consistent with my theory, right? No, absolutely, absolutely. Because he's 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 very afraid of, uh, of the full behind the scenes, uh, you know, footage mm-hmm. being being revealed. Because I am positive, I am positive that if uh, if that was ever revealed, you would see this was not a documentary. That this was mm. shot like a scripted film and you know take one all right this is uh you know you know oral sex take three i mean whatever it is i mean this is i mean that's i mean that's i mean that's 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 what this would be kill me please james we didn't really like the way you told the the wedding ring story last time let's let's try it a little bit differently this time and action I mean, that's that's the way this would be. And that's not a documentary. You're actually a genius, you know, I have to say, because there are, there is actually an, an incident where they 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 there's a scene where it turns out they went back, I think, 17 months later. Right. As yes. if it, uh, to make it a composite of the same shot. But Eagle Eye Jackson fans noticed that the the shrubbery outside was different. So it was a different period in time so it just goes to show you that you're spot on john you are actually spot on in that these was done methodically and more importantly 
we actually have Reed on tape correcting Robson. When Robson says friend, Reed corrects him and says lover. And I remember when I saw that, I was like, okay, that's odd. Why would you be correcting someone? I mean, it's their story, not yours. So if he says friend, clearly he meant friend. And what, and what do you think? Sorry, I, I mean, I, I wanted to end this earlier. What do you think about Reed appointing himself as their spokesperson? I mean, it's right. very odd. What's your view on that? I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I have said that numerous times where I've never seen a documentary filmmaker become the spokesperson mm -hmm. and PR person. And by, by, by the way, not just speaking on behalf of their cause, but correcting their story in the mm -hmm. media for them. We already, them, alluded, yes. we, we already alluded to that um, with regard to Safe Chuck and the train station. To mm -hmm. me, to me, you know what it's like? It's much more like the director of a fictional film. Because a director mm. of a fictional film has ownership of all the content because it came from him or her. Wow. Okay, so so if Martin Scorsese gets asked about the performance of an actor in a film, he's responsible for that. So it makes sense for him to be the spokesperson or the PR person. It does not make sense when no. it's a documentary, especially when you've got two adults. <laughs> who can speak for themselves. And and so um, I think it's very telling. I think it's very telling that this was not a documentary. This was a fictional film. Yeah, I, 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 I'm inclined to agree. I, I think it was very odd that they went into hiding pretty much as soon as the film came out. They did the Oprah show and just disappeared into the ether. And Dan Reed took it upon himself to basically be their spokesman. And I thought, this is just very, very, very strange. You know, um, he, he may he, he I actually engaged him fairly recently where he he posted a comment on Twitter, essentially saying that Jackson paid money to stop legal proceedings. And I went on Twitter and I said, well, actually, Jackson settled a civil suit and you would actually know this if you did your homework. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's, it's, it, it was almost like they were trying to infer that settling the civil suits stopped the uh, accuser from testifying in a criminal proceedings. No such thing could ever happen because it's legal. It's illegal. It will be bribery or suborning a witness or whatever you want to call it. So clearly the fact that Jackson settles the civil suit has no bearing on the criminal uh, um, investigation at all. But Reed, being Reed, he, he puts it out there and people swallow it. And he actually responded. And so I bombarded him with a lot of your work, actually. A lot of your, I post your articles all the time. I post your clip from Glenn Beck, where you actually mentioned the fact that Wade Robson was found to have lied so egregiously during uh, the discovery process that the judge threw out his entire testimony. So honestly, all I can say is thank you very much for just being a journalist <laughs> in a world well, of pretty... Sorry, carry on. Sorry. No, well, thank you for for your kind words, <laughs> and uh, um, I, it's nice that someone cares and someone appreciates it. And um, very much. And, and, and thank you for your your knowledge of this case, which is extraordinary. And so it's been a good conversation. Thank you so much. It's been a fantastic conversation, John. Thank you very much, and uh, and I will continue to 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 follow you on on Twitter, and and you know shout for the cause because i think that um my channel here is about curiosity and, and knowledge and understanding and i think that um the whole jackson uh allegation we we need to have every we need to have all the data that's all that's that's all we care about here so honestly thank you very much for being for for, for, for doing what you do there are not many of you you're probably one of five on the entire planet but thank you very much for agreeing to do this, and I'm sure I will speak to you soon. And for all the viewers, uh, please like and subscribe. And I believe that um, you're at Zygmunt on Twitter? Zygmunt Freud. Your... Zygmunt Freud, Freud. On, on, on Twitter. I'm going to post links to all the articles that you wrote and links to some of your previous interviews as well. Um, because this is, this, is, this is true journalism, and I hope that if there are other... Uh, um, 
people who want to, to, to be journalists, they can, they can watch this and, and, and use this as um, inspiration, if you like. Thank you very much, John. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm not going to keep you any longer because trust me, I'm tempted. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. We did. We did. We did.